Perturbation methods. And this is for non-degenerate uh, solutions. Uh, dealing with degeneracy is not harder, but it's more involved. Uh, perturbation methods are basically a bookkeeping method in which you write out your functions as expansions and then you collect terms. Uh, dealing with degeneracy just kind of adds another level of that bookkeeping. And all of these solutions, again, you can find these in lots of textbooks. I'm just stepping you through uh, this first method, uh, and the rest you should be able to follow as, as needed. So let's start uh, by saying that uh, you have some operator, say the Hamiltonian, because we all love the Hamiltonian, because it's fun to write. And the Hamiltonian we have is not a trivial Hamiltonian, but we're able to break it down into a Hamiltonian that we know how to solve, plus a Hamiltonian that we don't know how to solve. And we're going to put a little lambda value up there, and, and that term is going to allow us to turn on and off this perturbation. I should actually mention this here. This is called uh, this is also called really Schrodinger uh, perturbation theory. So H prime is a small perturbation to H0. H0 is our known solution. So H0, I'll, I'll write over there in a second, is our known solution. This lambda value that's uh, the parameter that we use to turn on and off this perturbation. So zero less than lambda less than one. So it allows us to have it off for zero or one being on. So we're, we're able to, to gradually turn it on and, and look at what it does. Now, I said this, this is in our known Hamiltonian, which we have known solution to. So we'll say that we have uh, H0 psi n 0 0. So this is known. So that could be, you know, particle in free space or particle in a box, the, the hydrogen atom, what have you. But this is something we know all these values. So I'm using H0 to be the known Hamiltonian and a zero to indicate the zeroth uh, solution, which is a known solution. And I'm gonna this written up here. What we're going to say now we're going to say is that we want to solve H psi n equals Here, 
10 to 0. Again, 0. Zero. So you know, we're turning the perturbation off gives us the solutions that, that we have. Uh, but if we don't have lambda equal to zero, uh, then we need some approximation. And the way we're going to get at this is we're going to expand the energy and the eigenfunction, or we'll call it the eigenvalue and the eigenfunction, as uh, a power of lambda. So let's say Energy as a, as a uh, uh, in powers of lambda and psi n one psi zero to infinity lambda j psi n j similarly. Okay. Now let's take and substitute. Our expansion into the eigenvalue problem, and we're going to get. Oh, sorry. We're also going to substitute our Hamiltonian in, and this is going to give us H zero plus lambda h prime is equal to. is equal to the energy times the wave function for the eigenfunctions. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply through all of these terms and all of these terms and then multiply through all of these terms and then we're going to collect common powers of lambda. So what I mean by that is every term that has in front of it a lambda raised to the zero, well, I know one, will collect. So for example, uh, h not multiplied by psi n zero has a lambda equal, a lambda raised to zero in front of it. And that's the only term on the left side. On the right side, the only term that exists is e n to the zero, psi n to the zero. Okay, 
So that's our, our known solution. So that's a solution with no perturbation. Let's change colors to cyan. Lambda to the one. So now we have as lambda h prime multiplied by psi into the zero plus h naught multiplied by lambda psi n to the one on the left side. And on the right-hand side, we have e n to the 0 multiplied by lambda psi n to the 1 plus lambda e n to the 1 multiplied by psi n to the 0. for lambda squared, and what's I write it down here? H naught psi n two plus H prime psi n one equal to E n zero psi n to the two plus E n to the one multiplied by psi n to the one plus E n to the 2 multiplied by psi n to the 0. And you can do this all the way up. So we can keep going to finer and finer degrees of perturbations. So that lambda raised to the 0, that's just our known solution. So let's, let's skip and start looking at the, the first, first perturbation. my psi n to the 1 over there. And now I'm adding to that h prime minus e n to the 1 psi n to the 0 is equal to 0. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to take it and we're going to integrate it on the left, by psi n star to the zero, and integrate. And in doing that, we'll get integral psi n zero star h naught minus e n zero psi n to the one plus the integral psi n to the zero star h prime minus e n to the one psi n to the zero is equal to zero. Is, uh Psi star zero distinct from oh, psi zero star? No. Nope. Just you did it. Just be nice sloppy. Oh, no, no, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta write the third that one. Okay. So we got two terms here. Let's look at the let's look at the left term first. So the left term. The left term, I 
and multiply through, and that gives me integral psi n star 0 h naught psi n 1 minus e n integral psi n 0 star 0 psi n 1. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to give you some Hermitian math that uh, to you it's going to look like magic. What I can tell you is that if you go into an undergrad physics book, you spend the better part of a week just dealing with Hermitian algebra. And there's an identity from that that tells us that psi star h is equal to in the quantity integral d star h psi star. And that's that's a known uh, a known algebraic uh, relation. Uh, and that allows us to take this and to rewrite it, to rewrite it as integral psi n one star h not psi n zero quantity star um, h not operating on psi n not is just going to be e n psi n not right because we know this from our uh, uh, eigenvalue equation, which means now that we have en0 times the quantity integral psi n1 star, star psi, star psi n0 star. And the end. And one. Okay. This term and this term are both equal to zero. And that's because Eigen functions are orthonormal, and these terms here and here are not in the same set. Which means this entire term is going to go to zero. So now we're only left with the right hand term. And that right-hand term that right-hand term here we'll write out integral psi n star 0 h prime psi n 0 is equal to e n 1 integral psi n zero star psi n zero so this is equal to e n one so now we've got the solution 
to our first perturbation uh, in terms of psi zero. So both of these eigenfunctions are known because we know those, and our perturbation Hamiltonian, or the, the pertur perturbation addition. So this gives us en1 is equal to the integral psi n0 h prime psi n0. So that's great. That's, that's useful for us. Because presumably, this is known and those are known. So we have that way we're solving for h prime. Yep, so we've got our, uh, we're not solving for h prime. h prime is our known perturbation. So we have something like a, a you know, a, a square well, and then we've got some shift to it, some perturbation, or some bump in it. So in our, uh, in our Hamiltonian, which was here, h is equal to h naught plus h prime, that's our Hamiltonian. That's the known Hamiltonian, and this is the one that we have a small addition that uh, corrects for it, or it, 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 adapt, uh, it, it adapts it in a way that we can't easily solve directly. See? So yeah. So so <clears throat> so phi not uh, phi not or, or sorry psi not and e not or e and not are the stationary ground state solutions. Uh, the e naught and psi naught are the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for the known Hamiltonian problem. Okay. So those could be the uh, the solutions to the hydrogen atom. Okay. And then we take the hydrogen atom and we say, oh, and we are actually we have an example here in which we're going to include the effect of gravity. Okay. So we have a Hamiltonian which is just uh, the electrostatics. We add gravity to it, and then gravity is a small perturbation. In that perturbation, we can calculate the change in the energy or the the boost in the energy due to that perturbation. Okay. So we've got the eigenvalues. Now let's get the eigenfunctions. And again, this is all just bookkeeping, which is why I wanted to make sure that that uh, that we got through this. So. Uh, Let's assume that our perturbation to our wave function can be expressed as a linear sum of known wave functions. So those are our known solutions from our known Hamiltonian. This is our Solution we want to get a and k we don't have a solution to yet, but we're summing over all possible k's. So going back to our uh, first order terms, we can go back to our first order terms and substitute our guess wave function into these, and if we do that, we get. Are two terms in terms of our uh, psi n1, and then I substitute our expansion, and then I collected the two terms in terms of psi n0, and the total sum is equal to zero. Now I'm going to take this entire expression here, 
here, multiply by psi, uh, fingers, sometimes my fingers get ahead of my brain, uh, psi sub L star zero, and integrate. So if we do that, we're going to get integral psi L zero star H naught sum K A N K one psi K zero. minus P N zero integral psi L zero star sum K over K A N K one psi K zero plus the integral psi L zero star h prime psi n zero minus e n one integral psi l zero star psi n zero equals zero. Okay. Well, we recognize here the Hamiltonian acting on the h sub zero, acting on the zero uh, eigen functions is just going to return the eigen energy of, of that. So that means here we have E L zero A N L one and so in part what happens is H naught returns the energy the eigen energy. The other thing that happens is that this A term can get pulled out in front of the integral. And the third thing that happens is that L and whatever value of K is in the sum, they're equal to zero except when L is equal to K. So that K in the sum becomes L all the sum except for k equals to l goes to zero, and that's where this first term comes from. The second term, same thing happens. Now here, we don't have a Hamiltonian, but we have psi l zero acting on psi k zero, which means that every term is equal to zero except when k is equal to l, and in that case, it's going to be equal to one. So that means this second term becomes E N zero A N L one. Third term is gonna stay the same. So we don't know really what to do with it. And then the last term, again. Orthonormality tells us this has to be a uh, Dirac delta. Sorry, uh, not Dirac, but a Kroeger delta. That'd be equal to minus E N one del N L is equal to zero. Okay. Um, let's start with the simple part. The simple part is, we'll say, I'll change the colors here because I'm going to have a kind of conditional expression here. So those two first two terms cancel? They will. They will, and they will when 
n are not equal to l. Because right now they can take any value, and the real trick here is that when n is equal to l, this becomes a little bit more messy. But let's let's just say let n not be equal to l. So when n is not equal to l, then that makes this term go away, and it makes uh, those two terms become E L zero minus E N zero of A N L one plus integral psi L zero star h prime psi n zero equal to zero. So that's known, known, not known, 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 known. We can solve for our a. A n l prime, or called a l n one, is equal to L1 is equal to negative integral psi L0 star H prime psi N0 over E L0 minus E N0. and not equal to L. So that goes a long way. That gives us everything expect, except for the case where N is equal to L. And that is a little bit more that's a little bit more involved. So when N is equal to L, uh, Well, there's, there's a degree of arbitrary, arbitrariness, arbitrary, is arbitrariness a word? Arbitrariality? Arbitrariality? Is that a word? Well, there's, there's, there's something arbitrary about this, and I'll show you where that comes from. So let's, let's, uh, Erasing everything. Uh, when we're talking about these ANs, remember these ANs. Expansion. And what we're essentially doing is these k's, these uh, a's, are the degree to which our perturbed solution is projected into each of our bases, right? Remember, we can always talk about our eigenfunctions as a basis set that describes this infinite complex dimension complex infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So we're basically letting this be the uh, dot product of these two on each other. So let's, let's go back and think about taking the projection of a wave function onto itself, which is looking at normalization. The normalization constraint is that psi n 
psi is equal to 1. Now, if I can write these psi's out as uh, powers of the uh, uh, perturbation parameter, our lambda, that's going to allow us to write integral psi n star 0 plus lambda psi n star 1 plus lambda squared psi n star 2 plus dot 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 multiplied by psi n 0 plus lambda psi n 1 plus lambda squared psi n 2 plus dot dot dot. Okay? And it's equal to 1. So that's going to be equal to One plus zero lambda j plus one, right? We're basically getting rid of all those higher order lambdas, which means that we collect on our lambdas here. We're collecting lambda zero integral psi n zero star psi n 0 is equal to 1, lambda 1, integral psi n 0 star lambda n 1 plus integral psi n 1 psi n 0 star there is equal to 0, 2, Integral psi n zero star psi n two plus you get the point. You can add these things together. It's in the notes. Now we can go up to higher order, but we're interested in this first order perturbation. The first order perturbation. Where we got the normalization constraint gives us this, which is a n n one plus a n n one star, and the reason they're the star is because we switched their positions, right? Is, this is the projection of the ni wave function on the n0 wave function. This is the projection of the n0 wave function onto the ni direction, or n1 direction. So that's equal to 0. OK. But each of these coefficients, they're just complex numbers, right? So it's like saying, you know, a plus bi plus a minus bi, right? They're the same value except for the complex conjugates of each other. It's equal to zero. So that tells us right now a has to be equal to zero. So now we have you know, bi's, and these are complex numbers, right? They're, uh, they're the uh, uh, coefficient in front of the imaginary part of the wave function, or the imaginary part of the complex number, which means I am <coughs> re a plus bi. And here's where the arbitrary nature comes from. In quantum mechanics, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, that angle, the phase, we get to choose. And here, we're going to say, let v equal 0, meaning that this is going to be here, meaning 
B will also be zero. It doesn't have to be. This is the something, this is the part that we're adding that is, uh, we would say that to within an arbitrary phase shift, we're getting a solution. And that solution is that A and N is equal to zero to within an arbitrary phase shift. So, Zero if n equals l. And that gives us the, the last term in the perturbation. And we can do this for higher order perturbations if you want. Again, it's just a lot of bookkeeping, and it's, it's not hard. You just spend a lot of time writing things out and double checking you got the correct. So we've got 15 minutes. Uh, if there are questions, let me know. If not, I'd like to uh, solve the problem of um, the influence of what? Five. You have five minutes. Okay. No. Uh, it's one page. So we're, we're going to solve uh, the effect of gravity on the hydrogen atom. Unless there's questions. Again, it's all in the notes. And I have not posted these yet, but the rest of them are online. If you haven't received where to find the notes, uh, it means you're not getting my email, so you should uh, come talk to me. Uh, but let's let's do gravity. Let's let's look at h is equal to h zero plus h prime. We're gonna let h zero be equal to negative h bar squared over two m del squared minus e squared over r, and we're going to allow h prime to be equal to minus g m m p over r. That's gravitational attraction. We're able to solve this one after you know three hours. Uh, this we can't solve, but what we can do is we can get a correction to our known solutions. So our first order energy correction, E1S, 1 is equal to integral psi 1S, 0, star, G, M, P over R, psi 1S, 0, dr. Uh, just solving the, the radial parts here, we get 1s0 is equal to 1 over pi, square root of pi, a naught to the 3 halves x back r over a0. Putting this into here and into here. We get E one S one to integral zero to pi sine theta d theta integral from zero to two pi d phi integral from zero to infinity r squared dr one over pi one over a naught cubed x of negative 2r over a naught negative g m m p over r. So we took our integral, which was an integral over theta b r, uh, wrote that out, turned the crank, is that a naught? What? Then the uh, psi 1s at the very end, is that over a naught? Yeah, over a naught, that's more radius. Because uh, this is being solved. Uh, yeah, this is being solved for a stationary, uh, stationary atom. Uh, and when you integrate this, you get E1s1 is equal to minus 
g m mass of the electron mass of the proton over a naught and if you take e 1 s 1 divided by e 1 s 0 you get around 1 times 10 to the minus 40. So we can calculate that the influence of gravity on the electronic energy states of hydrogen is around uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 40 river. So that's perturbation theory. It is basically a bunch of bookkeeping. If you go to non-degenerate perturbation or degenerate perturbation theory, there's a few more steps in it. But again, it's nothing but uh, uh, bookkeeping. Something that when I started in the field, I would hear you know, perturbation theory, this and that, and it, it always sounded scary. It's not. It's just something that you can look up in a book or uh, turn the crank if you feel like making it at home yourself.